they control 60% of the African Americans that were coming into America. It was coming through Newport, Rhode Island. So, and they made a, a substantial amount of money. So people need to look up this information so you can own it for yourself, that there's a correlation that we have in common with them. And that is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with old Roman colonies. And as I said, Rome has a connection with the Jewish community through Theodore of Khazar and Leo, the fourth, second, I've shown it before in the last episode of Dudes Blue, but I'll try to put a reference here. Don't want to misquote. But long story short, they have a connection together because they were married into each other's family. They have commonalities, even with normal Freemasons, but they birth Freemasons. They cannot betray each other because they are part of the same club. Freemasons have so many off branches as well. You have Skull and Bones, which George Bush was a part of. You also have Church of Scientology, which are loosely related in some way because the L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, was trained by Aleister Crowley. And Crowley was a very evil man. And he was pretty much the grand priestess. He, was, he considered himself the most evilest or wickedest man uh, the world has ever known because he did such inhumane and things to defile himself in order for the research to enhance the um, Golden Dawn, which is an off branch of Freemasonry, and to enhance the Freemasons, he committed himself to occultic dark magic practices, which are goes back to forms of Kabbalic influence, which is from Judaism and also from um, the Babylonian Talmud, which includes lots of black magic and black uh, dark energy practice. And me saying the word black and <laughs> dark energy is the reason why I'm saying that word I do not like as a lexicon to identify my people or myself, because I'm claiming by saying that, that I'm an inanimate ob object. Uh, I'm more than that, I'm a human. And this is the reason why there was resistance to the term Black Lives Matter, because people can humanize a color. They can humanize an ethnic group. And that's why it's important to know where you come from and know world history. So yeah, so the people that controlled the transatlantic slave trade were Ashkenazi Jews, and they, Dutch, these Dutch Jews, of Ashkenazi descent, these were Dutch merchants and they also provided their ships to transport slaves back and forth. Now what they'll do to deflect the situation is they'll tell you, oh, we weren't so heavily involved. Uh, actually, uh, Arabs enslaved uh, Africans as well. Uh, yeah, well, they don't talk about the Arab slave trade. What they don't tell you about the Arab slave trade that actually did take place is that Arabs, um, they enslave those um, for conquest in terms of they they didn't uh, they didn't convert to uh, Islam some of them didn't and some of them they felt a necessity as an art of war that they needed to have them work for them but it wasn't the level of brutality of like slave breeding buck breaking that took place in Jamaica, there was no raping of men to control men or anything. Um, they, they were just simply, it was just another level of conquest, which happens in all societies, whether someone took over a land or of, of another sort, but they still had humane ways of, of taking over a group of people because they had religious values that were involved. Uh, and that came from their Islamic culture. So it was a time when when white people or the other culture were slaves, and the Moors did them dirty. But did they ever teach you about a Moor in school? No more Moors. You don't even you know because they don't want to see that visual of us winning. Because that's what you do when you take over a culture. You take their religion, you erase their heroes, their artifacts, and anything they ever did strong, and you make them think that they've never been, been strong and they've always been weak and they've always needed you. And that's how they did this to us. Look how strong we are. Why are we listening to them? 
Well, that's the only way it would work. They, they, they'd have to discredit us in order to, to justify the mistreatment. And they make right? us discredit ourselves. They got, yeah, they have to do that. Yeah, right. And they're so, they, they're so good at it that they've actually convinced a lot of us to actually aid them in, in destroying our image. There is no deep rooted brutality that you hear about with Arabs involving parts of Africans in, in conquest. So other African tribes did the same thing in Africa when they would take over a land, you know, they would capture people. And this happens with all indigenous groups. You can hear similar stories in Australia, you can hear similar stories in New Zealand, you can hear similar stories in the Polynesian, Pacific Islands, you can hear similar stories with indigenous people in Russia and in Siberia and how they all fought against each other at one point and they did take over land. But um, but there wasn't the brutality that Europe brought onto Africans. And that was brought onto Africans in a very specific way because when the, as I said, they had a Eastern Byzantine Empire and a Western Byzantine Empire. And on the Eastern side, Rome still controlled that, but on the Western side, Moors, African Nigerian Moors and African Sephardic Jews controlled Europe. Africans controlled Europe from 711 AD to 1492. This palace was the product of a very real, very gritty history. The Alhambra was built by a religious empire which, at the pinnacle of its power, dominated land from China to Africa. An empire which had the wealth and intellect to build such masterpieces. An empire whose history goes back to the deserts of 7th century Arabia. Propaganda sparked by the Crusades has given us an enduring image, the diabolical Moor, a dark-skinned, savage, alien enemy. But this character is a complete invention and tells us nothing about who these people really were. Now, archaeologists and historians are starting to piece together the real story of the Moors in Spain. They're uncovering the remains of hidden cities, discovering the role of Muslims in the revival of the classics, and decoding the meaning of Islamic buildings. A fascinating picture has emerged. I'm going to use this new research to explore what happened when East met West in Europe. If there is one place which challenges the stereotype of the treacherous, bloodthirsty Moor, it's here, the Alhambra Palace in Granada. The Alhambra is one of the most complete medieval Islamic palaces in the whole world. It was built by the Muslim kings of Granada in the 14th century at the height of their power. Its name means the Red One because the dark surrounding soil has given its stones an earthy reddish hue. The marvel of the Alhambra is its mystery. Not a single account of life here survives. All its archives were incinerated in the fires of the Inquisition. But the Catholics couldn't bring themselves to destroy this place. The Alhambra is one of the wonders of the medieval world. And by preserving it, they've kept a box of secrets that we can use to decode the civilization that built it. Inside the palace walls, the architecture is breathtaking. Within decades, Islamic Arabs had reached as far as Persia in the east. In the west, they'd conquered Egypt, Jordan and much of North Africa and were within spitting distance of Europe. But Islam wasn't only interested in territorial expansion. It was also a faith committed to the pursuit of learning. Among the Prophet's first revelations was the instruction, seek knowledge. No, no, no. 
This meant that from the very earliest days of Islam, literacy and religious study went hand in hand. Whereas a number of other religions of the day preferred to keep literacy the privilege of a clerical elite, Islam actively encouraged it. In the ancient Muslim city of Fez in Morocco, there are many examples of this unique integration of religion and education. In July 711, 7,000 Berber tribesmen stormed across the Straits of Gibraltar and invaded Europe. The Muslims then began an incredible process of expansion. In just four years, they'd colonized almost the whole of Spain, had crossed the Pyrenees and were only halted at Poitiers in France. Were it not for this reverse, an army which had swept across two continents might easily have crossed the English Channel and occupied Britain. The Muslims called the country they came to Al-Andalus, the land of the Vandals. This refers to the Germanic tribe who ruled Spain at the time, the Visigoths. Spanish historians have traditionally seen the Muslim invasion of Spain as a terrible and violent attack, an assault on Christian Europe. In fact, here at the Visigothic site of Rocopolis near Madrid, archaeologists have found evidence which offers a rather different explanation. The city of Rocopolis, in fact, uh, was the uh, royal city founded by the Visigoths in order to demonstrate the power of the new state. The dimensions were spectacular for this period. And this complex is the, the most important discovery in Western Europe. What was it at the time that the, the Muslims were invading? But what was the state of the city then? They found it not only here in this part of Iberia, but in everywhere of the Al-Andalus, uh, uh, they found it uh, cities in crisis. A social crisis, of urban crisis. The traditional explanation is this idea that when the Arabs came, the society collapses and the city collapses. It's not true. It's not true. The collapse of the city started during the Visigothic period. If you read the orthodox Spanish histories, then you'll learn that predatory Muslim hordes forcibly appropriated Visigothic Spain. And there certainly were some invasion battles. But at many places, like here at Rocopolis, it seems that the newcomers were actually welcomed with open arms. We even have treaties where the Visigoths enthusiastically hand over their land in return for effective Muslim protection. When you were excavating, did, did you find any evidence of violence at the time of the Arab invasion? We don't have evidence of violence. Not, not at all. In, in this area was a peaceful, and the archaeology is showing another landscape, no, another explanation too. Palm trees, lemon and orange groves, avocados, artichokes and pomegranates, none of which had been seen in Europe. Because of Abd al-Rahman's sophisticated trade network, this new agriculture created huge wealth. And these riches were used to build one of the greatest cities in the world. While the inhabitants of London were still living in wooden houses, the people of Cordoba had built a cosmopolitan city with a population of over 100,000, the largest settlement in Europe. In other parts of Spain, there are emerging lots of sites, fortresses, villages and cities almost everywhere. People were Arabized, losing the form of Latin they were speaking unto them, and they were Islamized in the sense that they dropped Christianity and converted to Islam in um, massive numbers. Really. Were these forced conversions, or was the idea of Islam particularly attractive? It's always very difficult to say why someone converts to another religion, isn't it? But uh, I think 
th 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 there is no evidence on it of any force, uh, force, uh, forced conversion at all. In a way, the uh, Islamization and Arabization of uh, territories like Al Andalus is very similar to what happened to the uh, Roman Empire when people wanted to convert to the values and to the cultural values, to the religious values, and to the way of living of what seemed to be a, a, a civilization which had uh, lots of advantages. I think it's very easy to forget that, that, that at this moment in time, Islam is a culture of, of innovation, isn't it? As you said, it's drawing in ideas from the East. It's a culture of uh, phenomenal innovation. The opportunities of living because of the market, because of the trade relations and so on, which were much more interesting. The Islamization of Spain did more than change the name of the god that people worshipped. People converted because this was a religion which had something to offer them. It had wealth, it had social structure, and it had intellectual power. Cordoban scientists were streets ahead of the rest of Europe, especially when it came to medicine. This account comes from an Islamic physician who encountered a Christian doctor at work. They brought me a knight who had an abscess on his leg and a woman suffering from consumption. I made a plaster for the knight and the swelling opened and improved. For the woman, I prescribed a diet to revive her consumption. But then the Frankish doctor arrived and objected. Bring me a strong knight with a well-sharpened battle axe, he said. The knight struck a blow, the marrow of the leg spurted out and the wounded man died on the spot. As for the woman, their doctor affirmed the devil must have entered her head. Then he grasped a razor and cut an incision in the shape of a cross, exposing the bone of the skull and rubbing salt into the wound. The woman died in the instant. These give a detailed insight to the society that was created here. What kinds of things are being recorded on these bits of paper? In this document, there was written everything, absolutely everything. So does that mean that people in the lower classes of society could read? Yes, they are poor people with a very good education. The education is a way to be a better Muslim. So being a better Muslim is, is means that you know the Quran and you know everything of the law. The law is not a king law. It is the God law. D divine law. Divine law. Have, have you got any physical examples of these yes, documents? Yes, I have, I have one. Well, it is a contract about ploughing the land. Uh, for two years, we have to plant it with wheat and food, and he gets from this, this proportion of the production. The Muslims give a new thing. The land is mine. I rent you the land, and you give me a part of the production. People are interested not in having hunting lands like a lord or squire in England. The landlord rent his land. And it's empowering as well, because if you're the lowest rung of society and yet you have some rights to your own land and you can keep a lot of the produce. Yes. Every piece of evidence from Cordoba adds to the picture of a civilised and highly sophisticated city. It had medical centres, an organised legal system, and libraries full of academics and scientists working on ideas which were light years ahead of anything else in Europe. By the 10th century, Cordoba had become the official capital of Al-Andalus. People flocked here to work, either in the city's shops and markets or on rented land outside. In the year 912, a new ruler came to power. He was to take Cordoba to even greater heights. Abdel Rahman III was only 21 when he became ruler of Cordoba. These women were entertainers at every level. They had to be able to converse. They had to be able to discuss intelligent subjects. They had to be able to compose poetry, recite poetry. For Arabs, poetry is the single most important art of their culture. 
If we look at a picture of the entire world, there are only three cultures that we know of that had developed end rhyme by the seventh century, China, India, and the Arabs. This early Arabic love poetry directly influenced the development of literature in the rest of Europe. One of the primary characteristics of this poetry is a constant focus on the feelings of the lover. The poet is always complaining of the pangs of love and the distance of the beloved, and we, quite frankly, almost never hear from the beloved. Love is a welcome malady. Those who are free of it want not to be immune. And those who are stricken want not to be cured. The pain of separation and unrequited love are concepts that are very familiar to us. And there is a direct connection to that early Arab poetry. In England, some of our earliest and most enduring stories are romantic tales of knights and damsels, a courtly love tradition brought here by travelling French poets called troubadours. And those troubadours were inspired by the singing slave girls of Al-Andalus. The courtly love tradition has long been seen as something European. It came to form the basis of the Western concept of romantic love. But this cornerstone of our culture originated in Islamic Spain. Perhaps one of the most exciting moments, the transfer, if you will, of Arab music and poetry from the south to the north happens in the year 1064 in the city of Barbastro. Neighboring French knights besiege the city, which falls. Its booty includes hundreds of singing girls who go to the second in command, William VIII of Aquitaine. He would have received a large number of Moorish singing girls, which he then took back with him to France. He died at a fairly young age, and his heir, William IX, inherited this household at age 15. And William IX is known to us in literary history as the first troubadour. So it's almost positive that William IX would not only have grown up as a child in a household in which there were Arab singing girls, but at the age of 15, he actually became their master. It's one of the few moments where we can say that there's a transfer of singing girls from this point to that point, and then the point of reception is precisely where the first flourishing of troubadour poetry emerges. Hey guys, if you want to watch more clips, click here. And if you want to watch the full podcast, click right here.